I feel the unction of God to stand right now. And uh, I said, thank you, Vicki, and I meant that. That was a song that God used right there to assure me that I needed to go ahead and do this. Uh, the name of the song she was playing was Search Me, O God. Amen. All right, turn with us this morning. Psalms 139. Psalms 139. I want to tackle the last two verses of that chapter and the first six. And I'm going to start at the end and then go back to the beginning. And uh, we desire your prayers this morning. Psalms 139. Let's start at verse number 22, 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my faults and see if there be any wicked way in me. and Lead me in the way everlasting. Father, thank you for your word. We pray that you'd open it to our hearts this morning. I pray especially, God, for those among us who are struggling, for those, God, that need touch from your hand and a voice from you, God, to pierce their hearts and to break in, God, into those areas of life where they God, need to let go of and just let you fix. We thank you for what you're going to do, for I'm trusting you now. Appreciate the unction, the Holy Ghost of God. Without it, God, we're nothing. We know we can't do anything, but we're trusting you for it all. We love you. Bless you in this, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for standing. The psalmist in the last uh, uh, two verses of Psalms 139, which, by the way, as I was studying this this week, I found some, some places where some said that there are Jewish scholars and doctors that believe Psalms 139 was one of the greatest that he would pen. Now, I don't know how you can make one of the Psalms better than the other because I'll tell you right now, they'll fix what's wrong with you if you'll look into them. I remember a time in my life, I was a young man, when I, I never did venture into the Psalms very much. I, I always stuck to the epistles and the gospels and some of those great prophetic books in the Word of God and, and, and great men of God in the Samuel and Kings in that area. But I remember I began to pray one day and I said, Lord, I'd like to see some of the Psalms. You're talking about I opened and now he heard my prayer. And I'll tell you, ever since then, he leads me in there. It's at least once a week, Brother Lenny, that God will take me into the Psalms. Sometimes he'll give me something for you. Sometimes it's just for me. And But hey, I'll tell you right now, it's a book that's full. And I, I believe they sang them all. And I, I don't know that we sing any of them directly, but now that one in Psalms 139, the sister was playing it there just a second ago. The song said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. And I, I see in the end of this chapter what the psalmist was trying to get to through all of the first 22 verses. We find that ultimately his heart culminates in a surrender unto God where he's able to say, God, I'm willing now if you'll just search me. And I wonder today what it'll take for us to just get obedient to God and be able to say, Lord, I want you to just look down into my soul right now. I just want you to see me and to know me, God, as you truly know everyone. I want you to know my thoughts. I want you to know my heart. I want you to try them according to your precious word and rightness, and I want you to just fix what's wrong in me. Now, <coughs> I may do that several times this morning. That's all right. The, the, the Bible tells us there that the psalmist got himself into a place where he was able to say, Lord, I'm willing now for you to just search me. Amen. For I preach on them first six verses. That's where my heart is this morning. I keep trying to go there. But I want you to I want you to follow me, son, in this because don't ever lose the place where you want God to check you out. Oh, that we would as people be honest long enough to let the Holy Ghost of God move into our heart, examine us, and determine within us whether we're of a right spirit, whether our heart is right, whether we've got an all against a brother or a sister, whether there's been a love in us that has grown faint or indifferent toward God. Let me tell you something. God don't negotiate with my holiness. He doesn't allow sin in my life. And brother, he expects me to live right and to walk right. When I don't do right, there needs to be a prayer that's right, that gets right with God. We need to be right, brother, in order for God to be happy with you and I. Amen. And that's going to take some searching. Now, you think for one minute that I believe that you're going to be honest all the time. I don't believe it. 
I believe that innate within the man of God and within the people of God is that we like to lie about how we're doing. We like to lie about the condition of our soul. We like to lie about whether or not we're good or not good. Amen. It's, it, it, you didn't have to learn that trait, by the way. I believe you was born with it. Every one of us have got a tendency to lie about things and to tell things about ourselves that ain't right. And, but if you'll be honest with God, friend, he don't lie. When the Holy Ghost comes in and begins to examine you and you say, preacher, how in the world does that happen? I'll tell you, mostly it comes through this book. And if you ain't exposed to the word of God, you're not getting a proper cleansing. You're not getting a proper examination. If you ain't having to line up with the truth in these pages, brother, you're just making up your own gospel. And that's the way people do. They just make up their own gospel. Uh, the Bible said there was a time during the end of the judges that men did what was right in their own eyes. Do you know that the Bible said the ways of a man and the end thereof is death? Ain't none of us good. No, not one. Ain't none of you know how to get to heaven, including me. We just as bereft and bankrupt when it comes to God and desperate as a man could be. I don't care who you are. You might have been raised at the feet of Billy Graham or one of the greatest evangelists that have ever lived. But you'll go to hell this morning if you don't know who Jesus is. If you ain't been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, if your name ain't been written in his holy book, if you've not been set apart and sanctified by the Holy Ghost of God and his moving into your very soul, friend, you need still need to be saved. We need God to search us today. And friend, in order for that to happen, you've got Got to be willing. Amen. Now, the psalmist got himself to a place where he's willing. Say, so how'd he get there? Well, we're going to start at least with part of that this morning. How'd he get there? How do you get to the place where suddenly you're willing to say, God, search me? <laughs> Amen, Mama. I think I'm telling you right now, I believe that's that's the problem. Is that we ain't willing. We don't want God looking around in here. We don't want God up in our business. We don't want God watching what we're doing. We don't want God knowing what we're thinking. <laughs> he already does all that, by the way. <laughs> that's where I'm fixing the head, amen? That's the first six verses. That's how, that's how David got where he got to. It was that he suddenly realized that God could do all those things without I ever asking. What we need is to be honest long enough for the Holy Spirit of God. <laughs> I, I love this, don't you? I love the fact that he cares what I'm doing. <laughs> Amen. If he didn't care, brother, that'd be an indication he didn't love me. But he cares how I'm thinking. He cares what I'm doing. He cares what I'm singing. He cares what I'm listening to. He cares what I'm watching. He cares where I'm going. He cares with who I'm going with. Amen. He's got, you say, well, he's all in your business, ain't he? I'm telling you right now, I need some help with my business. I ain't ever been able to get my business straight. But I like it that the king of glory sticks his nose and his big hand right down the middle of my business. I need help help today and we need to be in the place daily where we can simply lay it open before God and say search me I need you to know my thoughts I need you to know my heart I need you to try me Lord I'll tell you right now boys you can, when you say God I need you to try me he can do the trying Amen. The Holy Ghost of God and the Word of God will come into you and it'll strip out everything that ain't supposed to be there if that's what you're after. If you want to get cleansed, you want to get right with God, let me tell you who to go to. You go to the Lamb of God and you get open before Him and you say, here I am. Amen. If I can get out of the introduction, I'm going to, get, I'm going to preach this morning. But He wants you, amen, to open your heart up and say, here I am, God. I know it ain't pretty. I know it ain't right sometimes. I I know there are times when it is, it is in defiance of what you do, but I need you to search me and know my heart and then make me right. Amen. Clean me up. Clean me up. You'll say, my goodness, I, you know, I hadn't opened my Bible. I don't know how many years ago I wrote this note, but I wrote this note in parentheses. I put our prayer. Search me, O oh God. 
and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way within me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I, I just put two words. I said our prayer. Before you can get to that place where you can actually pray that prayer, let me tell you something. You're going to have to get a vision of God. You say a vision of God. Well, I'm not talking about some kind of angelic or heavenly vision. I'm talking about a knowing. You need to get an understanding, friend, of who it is that you've trusted in. And I believe that's how the psalmist starts this one. And he goes through a couple of different things. And I, I, I don't know how much of it I'll get to preach, but I'm going to preach the first part if you'll let me this morning. Verses 1 through 6. But look with me here. The psalmist said, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Now, there is an acknowledgement right out of the gate in this particular psalm. And I'd love to heard this one to music. And I believe they put all of them to music, actually. And maybe we'll get to heaven and get to hear this one one day. But he starts out the psalm with what he ends the psalm with. He starts out the psalm and says, oh, Lord, he's acknowledging that God actually looks at him, that God actually watches him, that God actually knows him just as he is. Now, you may fool the preacher and probably have, and that don't make any difference, right? Uh, not that it's a good thing to be trying to fool anybody, but if you have, friend, don't consider yourself something great. It's most likely there ain't anybody in here can't fool me, but I'm not the one to worry about by the way if I know what you're doing wrong I'm going to pray for you but I'll have to look you in the eye and say I ain't much better I'm praying every day for myself you say preacher are you not right with God well I try to get right and I try to be honest about that truth as well every time I come into the house of God I want to get righter and I want to do the things that get me closer to God and brother an acknowledgement of that that God is searching us at all times is important important you need to know that is that God didn't take a day off this morning Amen. huh when it comes to the searching of your heart he's not on vacation today he ain't on PTO or out this morning he ain't on some other business or occupied or tied up no when you woke up this morning he knowed what you was thinking and you know what else he is looking he is watching. He is searching. Now, I don't know if that makes you uncomfortable. It does me at times, but I love that uncomfortableness to know that there is never a place, there is never a time, there is never a thought that is absent of the vision of my God. He is able and understands all there is to know about me. Now, he ends this chapter. He ends this, book, this chapter by saying, Lord, I want you to search me. But he begins this chapter by saying, Lord, I know you search me. I know you search me. And for the next few verses, he'll, he'll contend in a way that explains to us how it is that God searches us. I want to share this with you, and I hope it's a blessing to your heart this morning. Verse number two. Number two, he said, Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Let me stop right there. You say, Preacher, what exactly is the psalmist saying? Well, there are some things that are mundane to you and I. There are some things that really nobody accounts for. My wife don't care uh, for the most part about these things. I don't really care about what she does concerning this. Right? I don't go through the day watching my wife saying, well, she sit down again. And then looking, so, oh, she got up again. That seems a little bit minuscule. That seems like something that is irrelevant and unimportant. And yet what the psalmist begins with is a simple acknowledgement that God is so omniscient and so all-knowing and so concerned with all that applies to his own that, brother, he knows when I sit down and he knows when I get up. That is hard for me to grab hold of. Now, you say, who again is it that has taken such attention to your life? Well, let me tell you, He's the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. He is the Savior of all the world as well as the creator of it. He is the very one to whom every man will answer to him. He is the judge, the executioner, uh, the sentencer, and he's also the Savior. He's the one that cares when I sit down and when I get up. Amen. Amen. I've been under the weather the last few days, and I've sat down a bunch here this week. A lot of times I'm, I'm going pretty hard, day to day, light till dark, and, 
And I sit down a time or two, and there was a time when I sit down sometimes, I just fall asleep. And you know, Lord, no. <laughs> ain't that something? The Lord knows all about that. He knows every time that you sit down. He knows every time that you get up. You say, preacher, that is irrelevant. There ain't a thing about any of those things that would matter unto God. Why does he care? Let me tell you something. It's not for him that is those things that, that are relevant in their own nature. What he's trying to point out is that God is of a nature that that, that, that makes him see everything and acknowledge everything. Listen, in order for God to properly judge and to properly know, the only way he can truly know you is if he can see every second of your life. From the time you sit down to the time you get up and how many times you do it today, it's not those things that are actually relevant or important. The point is, is that God can see them. That God knows them. That's the importance of it. Is that what we understand through the next four verses? Is that what David is saying is, look, God knows you. He knows everything about you. Right down to the when you sit down and when you get up. And I thought it interesting to me that the psalmist would start with that. He would start with those things, Sharon, that were so trivial and unmeaningful to us to try to help us grasp his omniscience. The fact that he knows because he sees all. Now now we're starting to get to the attribute of God, which is which is omniscience, and and you'll get to his omnipotence next. That's what he jumps into in verse number seven. But but I just want to look at the fact that he knows. That he knows, right? He, he knows everything that Justin did yesterday. Right down from when he, he just sat down for a minute. Right? Nobody cared that he sat down. Nobody cared that he, he was just sitting there. Relax. Nobody cared what he was doing. But God seen it, you see. God seen it. And what the psalmist is saying is he said, Lord, I know that you search me. I know that you know me. He said, you knew when I sat down. And he said, by the way, you knew when I just stood back up. I know that you've seen everything that took place every second, every moment of my life yesterday. I know that you have searched me. And in that same verse, verse number two, and he said, you have understood my thoughts afar off. You know, I tried to really grasp that when Chris, what he was trying to say. And I thought about it. You know what? When somebody sees something afar off, they're at a distance. And yet what, what the psalmist was saying, he, he said, Lord, he said, my very thoughts in my mind, you can see them from your heaven. But you know, there's another way we could look at that. I don't know exactly which way the psalmist meant it. I'll just ask him when I get to heaven. But there's another way you could look at that. Because here's what I know about God. He's, he's not some way off yonder. He is, but he's also in me. Huh? You, you, you figured that out, ain't you? That he lives in me, but he's also around me. And he's also beyond me. He's fixing to get to that in the next couple of verses, but ain't that good? Yeah, he said, he said but my thoughts... Right, and that's one thing I don't know about you. Now, I might be able to follow around, take notes, and follow you. Say, oh, got when you sat down, got when you got up. But if you had a thought, who knew it? Who knew it? <laughs> he knew it. That's what he's trying to say. He's wanting to say, I know you. Right? You think you know you? I know you better than you know you. He said, I know the thoughts you had, and you don't even know where your thought came from. You you had one of them. I don't know how many times I get aggravated when I'm praying. Right? I get I get in the way of praying, and next thing I know, I'm thinking about a frog or something. Right? How'd my brain get there? He knew. He knew. See, he knew what I didn't know. Where'd that thought come from? How in the world did that get interjected right in the middle of one of my prayers? Why did my brain go chasing a rabbit that I didn't even know was hiding? I want you to know that God knows my thoughts from afar off. And if you was able to see into my mind, you'd say, Lord, preacher, your thoughts are far off. God knows them. Oh, what a wonder today that the, that the king of kings knows my thoughts. 
And that's the very thing that, that, that the psalmist was saying. He said, Lord, try my thoughts. He said, try my thoughts. And he said, I want you to know me. He said, for you, you see when I sit down, you see when I get up, those trivial, unmeaningful, irrelevant things of my life that nobody cares about, nobody's watching, nobody's observing, and said, yet, yet, yet it's not out of your view. You see every one of them and you acknowledge everything that I am doing right down to my thoughts. You know them all. Look with us, verse number three. Thou compassest my path and my lying down. Thou compassest my path <clears throat> and my lying down. That, that word compasseth, um, as I tried to get to the to the heart of what the definition of compassest meant. It, it kept leading me to this winnowing thought where it was, where it was a scattering, it, where it was a, a disseminating. There was a movement of it. And, and I finally got to the place where I was starting to grasp what it meant when, it, when I thought about when they would winnow that wheat and when they would blow that chaff out, that, that all that was left was what was intended to be. And here we find the psalmist saying, Lord, he said, what you do with those things, that what you do that pertains to my path, he said, you have compassed it. You, you're, you're, you're every part of it. You're at the place where, where, where all of my path, you know, he, he talked about first sitting down and standing up. And now he's talking about two other things that we're very familiar with. You know, when he refers to a path, he's referring to somebody that's in movement. Somebody that is walking. Somebody that is doing. Somebody that is awake. Somebody that is conscious. Somebody that is active. When, when we think about those active parts of our day, what the psalmist is saying is he said, you see every part of the way that I am walking. Not only do you see those irrelevant things where I sit down, get up, and the thoughts that I have and all of those things, he said, but, but you know the path. That I'm walking in. Amen. Does that bother anybody? That he knows how you walk every day. Not only does he know how you're walking. But he knows when you lay down. Now there are times when laying down is just one of those requirements of being a physical body. One of those things where your body simply runs out of juice. And you've got to lay down. You've got to recuperate. You've got to restore. And brother, when it comes right down to it, everybody's got to sleep. Do you know that God knows that? And he knows when I sleep. Now you can take that two different ways. And I'm not going to chase that one long. But I'll tell you right now, he knows if you're asleep spiritually too. Huh? He knows if you're active in the path that he has laid for you to walk as a Christian. He knows if you're active spiritually, if the way you're going is right, if it's wrong, if it's er in error. He knows that, but he also knows when you lay down spiritually and you say, I'm not doing anymore. I'm not working anymore for God. I'm not telling anybody about God. I'm not going to serve God. He knows when you lay down. He knows that. But I believe he's referring to the physical here. Because that's how he started. And so I believe he's still in that realm of those things that we think of and we know, right? Because everybody, they get up through the day sometime and they go to doing something. By the way, if you ain't doing something through the day, you need to figure out how to do something. Right? Because doing nothing going to get you in trouble. Probably already has. And so when you get up, God knows it. And when you're active in doing, you know, Lenny, that he knows everything I do on the job. It's part of my path. It's the way I got to walk tomorrow. It's what I got to do the next day. It's just, it's those things that we have to do. And do you know God cares about them? God interjects himself into my life. God cares what's going on in my work. God cares how I'm doing in it. He cares how I'm representing him through it. He cares about what I'm doing in the path. And brother, he cares when I have to lay it down every evening. He cares that I get enough rest. He cares that I drop it and that I pick it up and that I drop it and I pick it up. He knows all these things. Amen. And I want you to say what he said next. Let me make sure I... 
I read it correctly, and art acquainted with all my ways. Now, when you have an acquaintance, it means you know somebody, right? You say, I'm an acquaintance with so-and-so. Well, what's that mean? It means you know them. Right? You might know, not know them well. You might not know them like other people know them. But if somebody tells you a name, you say, I'm an acquaintance with them, then what I know is that you know them. And what he said is, is he said, Lord, he said, you are acquainted with my ways. Which means what? He knows my ways. Right? And that's what we've just said, right? He knows the activity of my path. And he also knows when I lay my head on a pillow, he knows 24 hours a day where I'm at, what I'm doing. And he is acquainted with everything in that time. That's amazing. But that's our God, right? He is omniscient, meaning that he knows all, he sees all. Just as if you were the only person on the earth. To comprehend or to conceive God in another way is to misunderstand who he is. If there's 8 billion people on the face of the planet and they say we just, we just turned to 8 billion this year. If there's 8 billion people on the face of this planet, let me be clear. He knows every second of every day of every human being. And yet leaves me tish thinking I'm the only one he's watching. That's who I'm talking about. That's who I'm talking about. He helps me in such a way that makes me think I'm the only one he's blessing. How's he got time for anybody else the way he's helping me? And yet for everyone else in the world, he sees everything as well. Now, we can nod and say, I got that. But don't think for a minute, I think you got that. Because your brain ain't of a capacity to get that. That goes beyond the realm of understanding or comprehension that we'll only get, I think, when glory has come in to us and we've lost this earthly. He said, you're acquainted with all my ways. Do you know there ain't anything that is unseen to God concerning you or me? Verse number four, he said, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it altogether. <laughs> I'm like the psalmist. I'm thinking, O oh Lord, he knows that too. Right? Those words that, that they, they, write on, they write on your tongue. You might not say them. You say, thank you, Jesus. I didn't say that out loud. He knew. <laughs> and, and he said, but lo, oh, Lord, he said, thou knowest that also. You know the very word on my tongue. You say, why in the world are you going on about this stuff? Listen, if you ever get an understanding who it is that's watching you, you might get to the place that you could say, watch me. Yeah. 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 See, there's a difference between how he started, which was acknowledging his understanding that God is omniscient in his being, that he can see all, he knows all, and it is focused all on me. He just acknowledged it. But in the end, he was able to say, would you watch me? Would you see me? Would you know me? Would you try me? Would you search me? And he got there by acknowledging who it was that was doing all of this. He said, you're acquainted with all my ways. He said, every, every word that will ever come from my tongue he said, you knew it. You knew it. All right, that, that's a different level. Because when you think about this, it, it kind of falls into the bucket of thoughts. Now, you ever said to somebody, well, I never had that thought before. No, that's a true statement for me and Lenny, right? We can, we can say to a lot of people, I never thought about that. <laughs> right, it takes big thinkers to think big things, right? I never thought about that. 
And yet what he's saying about the word on the tongue is he said, you may not have spoken, he said, but I knew that the word was there. The Bible said that of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So what he knows from on is that when you speak it, he he know where it came from. He knows the origin of that word and why it was spoken and the agenda to which it was spoken. Listen, you think you're fooling God. Let me be clear. You're not fooling God. You may have fooled everyone else, but they don't matter. The one who knows is not fooled. He said, you, you've known the very word of my tongue. No, I didn't say it, but you knew it. So he knows what you, you've, not even, what you've not even put in, into action. God knows The motives of the heart. Not just those things that could be calculated or measured. But God's able to see the agendas and the motives and the reasoning that is within your very soul. He's pretty good at this examining, ain't he? I mean, there's literally, what what David's trying to get him to see is, look, there's nothing he can't see about you. There's nothing he doesn't right now know about you. Verse number five. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Now, that word beset, that's not one we use, right? I mean, how many times do you use the word beset when you're talking to your friends? Right? I don't see anybody raising their hand, right? We don't use that word. So what's the word mean? Well, the root of it from the Greek it, it left you thinking about being encamped around. When, when they would lay siege on a city, they would surround it. They beset it. And what David said here in verse number five was as he said, thou hast beset me. He said, you out there in front of me, you're behind me. Guess what? He's on this side, and he's on that side. It started, it took me directly to what happened to a man named Job when the devil went before God, and he said, if you'd just take down that hedge, Job would curse you to your face. He said, but I can't get to Job because you've put a hedge about him. You know what Job was knowing? He is beset. He is beset by God. Front, back, sides, up, down. They ain't anywhere that I ain't beset of God. Jesus would go as far to say this. He said, you're in the Father's hand. And he said, no man is able to pluck you from the Father's hand. I love that, don't you? You know what that gives me a picture of? Beset. Jesus would say it again about Israel as he looked over Jerusalem that day and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would have gathered you as a hen doth her brood. You know what a hen does with her brood? Just a couple of clucks and them old wings get full because all them chicks run up under it. When Ruth showed up at the feet of Boaz that night, the Bible said that when he awoke and saw that she was down there and she told him why she was there, the Bible said that he cast his skirt over her. So what happened to Ruth? She got beset that night. She got something that surrounded her. And then we hear the old man of God in the, in the Old Testament where he said that God was looking for somebody that would make up the hedge. I'm looking for somebody, he said, that would stand in the gap that would make up the hedge for my people Israel. I'm looking for somebody that'll help me build a hedge around them that are my own. What the psalmist was saying was that, brother, when I fell into the hand of the king of glory, I got beset all around me. Do you know that I don't go anywhere that God ain't in front of me, behind me, beside me, above me, and below me? 
You believe that? I do. I actually believe it's biblical in every way. You say, how come? Because I'm beset. I am beset of God, meaning he has surrounded me completely. There is no part of my life that he is not completely control of. You know what he said? He said, wow. He said, wow, you got me. I love this. He said, wow, you've got me in your complete protection. You lay your hand on me. Don't you like it when he lays his hand on you? (laughs) It's one thing to know that I'm under his wing, but it's another one to feel the wing. Yeah. You're knowing then. He said, laid his hand on me. They said, he laid his hand. He's got me all around. And his hand is on me. His hand is on me. Now, come get a song if you would. What David was doing was opening, hopefully for the listener, the attributes of this omniscient God who in every way has proved himself all-seeing and all-knowing. David starts and he says, he said, God, I know you search me and I know you know me. He said, you know my sitting down and my rising up? You know my thoughts are far off? He said, you've compassed my path. Everything I do, you... You're totally surrounded. You see it. You know when I lay down? He said, you, the very words that would come to my... He said, you, you know all those. You're acquainted with all my ways. You've beset me. Thank God he's beset me. I love that. You've beset me. He said, you're behind me. You're before me. You're all around me. And he said, you've laid your hand on me. Amen to that, brother. And and so we go back to verse 23. We find there, you find then the essence of what he would do in verse 23 and why it's different from verse number 1. Because in verse number 23, he is now not acknowledging the omniscience of God but he is asking for it. That's when your life will change. It's one thing for you to say, I know he knows. But it's another for him to say, I want you to know. Reminds me of a story I heard this week, and I'll close with this. I heard a story about a, an evangelist that decided he was going to go to Mardi Gras and and evangelize them heathens. So he goes down to New Orleans, and he sits up on a corner, and he preaches to them all day long. <clears throat> they just drunk as, as skunks and, 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 and the vile and the wicked stuff going on everywhere. And, and uh, late that night, he gives up, and he goes back to his hotel. And early the next morning, daylight, he gets up, and he comes out of the hotel, and the first thing he sees is a drunk laying on, on the sidewalk sick. And he walks over to that drunk, and he said, friend, he said, can I pray for you? That drunk never even looked up at him. He said, yes. He said, I'm so sick. He said, I'm a preacher. He said, I'll pray. He said, please, yes, pray for me. The preacher said, oh, God, I pray that you'd help this drunk. And that drunk looked up, and he said, don't tell him I'm a drunk. Just tell him I'm sick. The difference between how David started and how he finished matters. Because I can tell you right now, whether you tell God you're you're drunk or not, he knows. And what David was saying was, look, you need to understand, God already knows. That's what he said. He said, I... I know you search me. I know you know me. But at the end of this thing, you hear a different heart. 
Once he, once he begins to see the attributes of this omniscient and omnipotent, meaning all-powerful and, and ever-present, once you see the, the attributes of this God, then suddenly we just have to start opening ourselves and saying, Lord, I want you to search me now. I want you to know me, know my heart, and I want you to know my thoughts. He already does. You see, the difference is that now David is saying, it's what I want, right? Not like the drunk, right? Don't, don't, don't tell him I'm a drunk. Tell him I'm sick. No, no, no. David's saying, I want you to know that I got some problems. And I need you to lead me into the way everlasting. I need you to help me. Listen, if you're ready to get honest this morning, let me be clear. God already knows. He already knows what you're facing. He already knows where you failed. He already knows everything about you. Yet he is still here. And he is still willing to help you. He still loves you. He hadn't cast you out. He's saying to you, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He can help you this morning. He knows. The question is, do you want him? And if you do, he can help you. That's the difference. Would you stand as we sing this morning? Do you want him to know? Are you willing, as the Bible would say, confess your sins? Do you want him to know? When you get to that heart where you're able to say, God, I want you to know. I want you to see where I've been, what I've done. Because I'm going to ask you to forgive me and to purge me of all of those things. If you need that today, he can help you with that very thing. Would you sing with us this morning? If you're here this morning and don't know him, if you need to be saved, would you come? If you've got a burden you need to give to God, why don't you come?